Assalamualaikum, good evening and welcome. It's good to see you all this evening on a rather chilly evening. Today's program is being organised by Open Discussions in association with the Gulf Cultural Club and as usual I'd like to thank Brother Dr. Sayyid Shahabi and Fatima Dosa without whom we would not be able to have this program and obviously without you participating and joining us as an audience uh, we couldn't be speaking to an empty hall. So all of you, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Today's topic, um, as you've received the email, I just want to make some opening comments before I request our speaker to make the presentation. However, before that, there is an apology. One of our speakers, Ajmal Masroor, is unable to make it this evening because he's had a uh, personal uh, situation developing and he needed that needed his attention therefore um, you know we have a eminently suitable speaker who will be speaking anyway so the topic today is really sectarianism as a weapon of subjugation and tyranny the rise of sectarianism in the past few years is seen as an attempt to stall the process of political change in the Arab world it was adopted after the fall of the Shah of Iran in 1979, then after the regime change in Iraq in 2003, and after the advent of the Arab Spring in 2011. And I would actually say that really the victory of Hezbollah in 2006 against the Zionist forces was perhaps a prelude to the if you like, the acid atmosphere that has been created in the Muslim world of sectarianism and not only just sectarianism vis-a-vis -vis, um, within the Muslim camp, i.e. Shia Sunni um, sectarianism, but also other minorities living in Muslim countries have also been targeted, whether it is the church being bombed in Lahore or other Christian places and, of course, the coverage that we have seen of um, the Christian town of Malula in Syria itself. So it's quite extraordinary how sectarianism is moving. Now, who is behind the sectarianism? I think that is a key issue to look at. As I said, after the victory of Hezbollah in 2006, I think the strategists in Riyadh and other Gulf countries saw to it that um, on the streets of Cairo and Karachi and wherever you went, there was definitely um, support for Sayyid Nasrullah. I remember traveling in the Middle East at that time after 2006, and whoever you spoke to, in fact, some of my Emirati uh, Sunni friends said that, you know, if this is what Shia means, be defeating the Zionists, then we rather be Shias. So it was kind of extraordinary development that was taking place. So what is, um, is there a link between sectarianism and dictatorship? How can the Muslim community challenge those, those whose interests dictate dividing, dividing and weakening the Ummah? That I think is a very important question and I'm sure um, our speaker, uh, who is, as I said, eminently suitable to talk on this topic, uh, first I'll introduce him and then um, the second sort of short presentation would be by uh, Brother Dr. Sayyid Shahbi. Um, our speaker needs very little introduction. He is Brother Dr. Muhammad Iqbal Asaya. He is a special advisor to the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain on Business and Economic Affairs and a tutor on the MCB's Leadership Development Programme. In the late 80s, he was the editor-in-chief of Afkar magazine, a groundbreaking news and analysis journal published in London. Iqbal's current interests are in Islamic and moral <coughs> finance. He was awarded the CB in 2006 Queen's Honours List for Services to International Development. That's a very short resume, and I'm sure I can sort of talk for another five minutes to introduce Brother Iqbal, as I said, who needs very little introduction. So we can we please warmly welcome Brother Balasari for his presentation.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Sisters and brothers, ladies, gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and good evening. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sayed for inviting me again at this forum. I was hoping that the other speaker would be here so I would have to do less talking but uh, that did not turn out as it was. However, I think this subject is quite involved and complicated and we need to understand it in a little bit more detail than just look at anecdotal evidence from here and there because that doesn't give us a bearing on the thing. There are two developments <coughs> in the Muslim world just under 200 years ago, which are quite important to understand this. The first one was the reaction to the, what is called the Indian Mutiny in 1857. The mutiny obviously was against British rule in India. But the aftermath of the mutiny was that there was a massive and serious crackdown on the Muslims of British India. Just to give you an example, those of you who are familiar with Delhi will know <coughs> a landmark of old Delhi, apart from the Red Fort, is the Chamanasi in uh, Old Delhi. After the crackdown and around there, the whole market in Old Delhi was obviously Muslims uh, up to the Red Fort. After the mutiny and the following crackdown, all the Muslims there were driven out and the mosque itself was let out as stables for horses and donkeys. So you could see the depth of the hostility which was created. I was lucky to be in Delhi with Professor Francis Robinson who showed me every street and corner. Yes, this is his main area of study. And he said, look, this house belonged to so-and-so and it was taken and given to so-and-so, X, Y, Z. The whole character of old Delhi was destroyed. But as a reaction to that, Muslims in India at that time started to think as to how to or what had gone wrong to make this possible. And two opinions emerged. One opinion was articulated by, and many of you may know him, Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, who put forward the idea that, look, this kind of traditional attitude, not learning new languages, not learning current uh, organization, technology, science, is going to leave us backwards. So his main thrust was to revive or to start fresh education including for the first time an agenda for educating women, which was very much not there. In fact, if you uh, read uh, opponents of him, like uh, Akbar al -Ahabadi, you can see, for example, the sentiment. So Akbar, in one of the couplets, I'll just read you one, says, Sanatpe chant vibyo ko jate hove dekh kar Akbar Tehrate Ummi Se Zami Me Gadre Pucha Jo Parde Ko Hoa Kya To Kene Lagi Ke Mardo Ki Akal Pe Gadre Diya So he said Akbar, uh, one day Akbar saw some women walking in the street and he felt like burying himself in the sand from humiliation 
He asked them, what happened to your hijab? They said, we threw it on the brains of men. See, Sir Say's idea of educating women was sort of satirized by people like Akbar, that this is wrong. Anyway, that was one trend which was very much in terms of understanding, accommodation, dialogue, discussion. And this was not easy for Sir Say. Because Sir Say himself had saved a number of British soldiers from being massacred in a place and when he came back to his home in Delhi, his own family had been massacred by the British. So obviously when you see that, you might become angry and take a, a, a kind of uh, direction which could be quite extreme. But he went back and reflected and he said the only solution is this. The other reaction and this is the more uh, relevant one in this context of what we are looking at today, was the idea that it was the failure was because the Muslims were not Muslim enough. They should become more pure Muslims. This, as you will note to in today's context, is the root of what we call Salafism. And that was embodied in the Deoband. As far as it went, there wasn't any problem there. But it had the roots and seeds which could easily develop into extremism. And today, if you go back, you will see that most of the Taliban, all of the Taliban, in fact, have come out of the Devon way of thinking. The closed, restricted minds, the hatred of other cultures and civilizations. You could see that the destruction of the Babylon Buddhas and things. This is an attitude which is expressed, you can see it in many ways. And then of course the legitimization of killing anybody who doesn't agree with you. This is the core of that. So it's that reaction into that faction which developed at different times and has been tapped by different political, religious, sectarian factions to create havoc. Uh, and we will come to that in Pakistan especially uh, during the time of Zia, what kind of havoc was created out of that. The other <coughs> development about the same time is the rise of Wahhabism in the Arabian Peninsula. Again, talking about a Salafi agenda, going back to the roots and closing your minds, labeling everything else as bidah or innovation, and also legitimizing killing of people who did not accept your uh, viewpoint. So unless you get these two in mind, we cannot understand what is happening today. Now what happened <clears throat> for recent times? The first thing is that with the Russian entry into Afghanistan, and this was of course during the time of the Cold War, so this was a very big challenge to the United States and its allies. They were ready to do anything to get the Russians out from there. They were able to bring the Wahhabis and the Deobandis together. The Wahhabis funded and the Deobandis provided the cannon fodder for creating what were called the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And it is not long ago that President Reagan hosted the Mujahideen and compared them to the founding fathers of the United States. If you read, uh, if you read uh, Professor Mamdani's book, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, that is all documented there. We may like to forget it, but that's the root. You bring these two extremists together. So the funding was coming from Wahhabis and the manpower was coming from the 
Dalal looms and whatever they were in the South, Pakistan. This formed the Taliban, which then took over Afghanistan and uh, also uh, forced the Russians to go out. At the same time, another development happened, and that was the triumph of the Islamic Revolution in Iran. Now, this of course was a big challenge to the established order, not only the Americans, but also everybody else. So the same force was now to be used against the Iran, against Iran on this agenda. And later on supplemented by Saddam Hussein and so on, which we know. So if you look at all this together, <coughs> You can see that this ideological fusion, and in fact, Osama bin Laden was uh, funded and nurtured by the CIA. He's not a stranger to them. He was useful when you want to get rid of the Russians from Afghanistan, and he was used effectively. When the Russians were out, some of these people especially what were called as the Arab Mujahideen, who were not Afghans, wanted to go back home. Now, the Saudis and others panic that if these guys come home, they are trained, they will create havoc here. And so they started to keep them away, to disturb them, to, you know, uh, make trouble for them. So, so then these guys started to say, well, this actually the next target should be our governments because these are really uh, the main obstacle to this. So you have people like Ayman Zawahiri and so on, coming up in Egypt and so on, again from the Takfiri kind of angle that governments were wrong. And they built upon other <coughs> narratives to build their thing. Until that time, apart from the revolution in Iran, there wasn't an overtly anti shi program. And in fact, if you see the whole uh, approach of uh, Imam Khomeini and so on, on this issue, it was quite radical from a Shi point of view. It was quite accommodating, conciliating. There wasn't any anywhere a propagation that Shi'is should attack Sunnis or should not pray with them or etc. etc. This was just not there. It wasn't, there was no agenda to inflame this. What made this problem bigger, of course, we'll see a little bit later, is the changeover in Iraq. But before that, with the coming of Sadat and Mubarak in Egypt, what happened is that the operational capacity of the seminary at Azhar was significantly reduced. The number of foreign students coming to Azhar started to fall, both because of lack of finance and lack of uh, enablement from the government. They weren't left alone, they were actually discouraged from this agenda. This gap was filled by the newly rising universities in Medina and Riyadh. So it became Saudi funded. Anybody wanted to go, they could go and study there and come back. Obviously, there is a difference between the thinking in Azhar and thinking in Medina. This Medina was coming out with Wahhabi Salafi thinking, whereas Azhar was much more accommodated. And you can see, begin to see the impact of this just around the time of the revolution. For example, if you go to East Africa, West Africa, Malaysia, Indonesia, 
you would find the beginning of this problem, and this is only, I'm uh, talking only amongst Sunni communities, not Shia at the moment. In Sudan, you would find, for example, some of these people returning from Medina saying that to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet was Bida. So you would know in Mombasa, for example, Mowgli is a big, is a week long celebration. Now, if somebody suddenly comes and says this is not right, those people have been celebrating for hundreds of years. What's wrong here? The Sudanese just couldn't understand what's happening here. Uh, Nigerians, same. So you see, this way there was the beginning of a split. But this was reinforced by more and more uh, scholars, if you like, coming back from Medina rather than Azhar. And in Malaysia, Indonesia, you could actually trace extremism rising as these people came from Medina. So today, it's the same thing. Most of the people are coming back from Medina. University. I mean, you just have to go to that university to see that nothing good can come out of it. And Unless we address that, we are not going to cure this problem because it's embedded in the whole structure of instruction, the background which informs that instruction and so on. And this is the big problem. Now the second big problem which happened is the changes in Iraq with the American intervention and so on. Clearly, there was an understanding, especially in Britain, that if one was to attempt to bring any kind of democracy in Iraq, at the end of the day, it will be a Shi'i dominated government because the majority of the people of Iraq are Shi'is. So however you formulate it, it will be that. It could be very extreme Shi, it could be moderated, it could, but there was no going away. So the British and our current head of MI6, John Sawyers, was the key advisor, has had advised the Americans not to do this. They said that Iraq, he said that Iraq can only be ruled by a strong Sunni dictator, can never be allowed to be a democracy. However, the Americans had their own ideas and understanding, so the changes that happened brought forward this. Now, apart from the government of Iraq and its, its problems now and so on, we are not concerned with that. We are looking at the psychology in the Muslim world. If those of you who can remember before the uh, 1991 uh, events in Iraq, every few months or yeah, every few months, a number of Iraqis would be rounded up and expelled to Iraq. And Saddam would say that these are Persians whom we are expelling. In the Arab mind, generally, the idea had come historically, which was, we will show you it's wrong, that Shiism was a Persian deviation of Islam had nothing to do with Arabs. Of course, this is not true. We know that Shi'is have started in Kufa, and then Iran is only a Shi'i state for the last 500 years. So for a thousand years, it was a Sunni state. <coughs> only under the Safavis, it became a Shi'i state. But that's history we don't want to go. We're looking at psychology. Now you imagine that suddenly you find a situation where you are told that a majority of a big state 
in the Arab world and one of the key steps in terms of Iraq, intellectual and otherwise, is a majority Shi'i Arab state. The whole historical narrative falls. And what you are seeing now is an attempt to reverse that and resort back to saying that this is not true. It is, Arabs cannot be majority Shia. You see the same narrative playing out in Bahrain, where they have tried their best to show that the majority Shia population in Bahrain is somehow Iranian or Iranian influenced. But clearly it is not. In fact, in Bahrain is a very strange situation when I went there. I found that a lot of the Sunni people, they speak Farsi in their homes. The Shia, they don't speak Farsi. So <laughs> it was quite a strange uh, uh, observation. Uh, obviously because they came from Mandalange and so on, so they did speak Farsi, the Sunnis. But the Shia, they don't speak Farsi, so now to make them into Persians was not an easy thing, and that's what the struggle is going on. In Syria, the issue is slightly different. Of course, the Syrian government is not a Shi'i government. It is what we call an Alawite government, right? The question of the Alawites is slightly different. These were traditionally very poor people. And out of their need, they were driven away from the city into the mountains. And because of economic necessity, a lot of their children joined the army. It was only employment available. Eventually, Hafiz Asad, who was in the army, who was from that group, took over the country. And, of course, established that dictatorship. And that continues. So it's a, it is clearly a minority uh, grouping which is now having a control of that. So it's a very difficult situation, but it's not a Shi'i Sunni situation. It's a, but you can now portray it as all kinds of things depending on what your agenda is. And you can see very extreme kinds of sectarianism playing out in Syria at the moment which is quite disturbing and for the majority of the population it is the worst of all worlds. They, I do not know how they are going to, out, they are going to get out of that. Okay, so what I have portrayed to you is that the roots of this problem lie in Muslim psychology as to how to deal with changing circumstances. Do you turn inwards and not do anything or, and blame everything on everybody else? Or do you try to lift yourself up and build something? In this scenario, of course, there is another change. Fifty years ago, sixty years ago, very few people questioned the monarchy. It was normal. Today, somebody says, I want to be a king, hereditary here. I, I don't think they will find a here in, in any place. So the whole idea of man, how to rule themselves, has changed. Now here you have a geriatric monarchy in Saudi Arabia which obviously that kind of change is extremely problematic to them. That means the end of them. So they are trying to avoid that change as much as possible. Right? And you can see that it's not necessarily only anti she Their whole uh, activity against the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, in, in terms of helping to overthrow them and then funding this military regime, 
is clearly quite uh, interesting and it puts a lot of the Muslim Brotherhood, <coughs> the Jamaat, the Islami and so on in a very big dilemma that their patrons are now quite clearly set upon destroying them because they cannot live uh, with that. So I think this sectarianism, and in fact one of the reasons for Morsi's overthrow could be that there was a feeling that eventually uh, this my brotherhood kind of thinking may come closer to Iran and therefore will challenge the status quo. So you can see that this is not a simple problem to solve and it's really simple people who are then radicalized and resort to all kinds of nonsense. But at the top, the game is quite clear that there is a battle for survival here and a narrative which has passed its sell-by date. And that is always the most dangerous step. Now, in terms of solution, I think the change will come from within the Sunni world. There will be a reaction against this extremism and there will be movement to curb it. This has always happened before and it's going to happen again. The question is when and how. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Um, after Brother Said's uh, short presentation, we'll have Q&A. We'll have uh, plenty of time and the um, amount of information and the usual sort of detail that Brother Said has presented, I'm sure, has ignited some questions in your minds. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Of course, our, my brother Khwan has already highlighted the main core of the uh, problem. The Muslim world today is, in, is made to be in a crisis. And it can avoid this crisis, as he said, and the change will come this time from the Sunni Muslims. Now, sectarianism, what is it, how, and where is it leading to? I want just to put a few points to you not uh, deliberate and deliberated uh, lecture. But first of all, I want to say that those who uh, are promoting uh, sectarianism are themselves not religious. The source of it, the funding of it, are, uh, is from people who do not believe either in Shiism or Islamism. Those dictators are neither Shia nor Sunni. They are dictators, and dictatorship has no religion or sect. Uh, this is number one. Number two, the sectarianism <coughs> is intended again to be and directed against the Sunni world rather than the Shia. Although in the outside and the victims are mainly Shia, they are killed, they are bombed in Iraq, in Pakistan, in. Uh, uh, in Afghanistan, in, in Lebanon, in, in Bahrain. Although the Shias are the victim, but the idea is to keep the Sunnis away from their real challenge. The real challenge is to, is, is to establish freedom, is to gain freedom, to get rid of, the, of dictatorship. If you do not make the Sunni world, especially after the Arab Spring, and you could see that it has only flourished uh, recently, uh, after the uh, Arab Spring. And I also agree with the Akhbar that three times this sectarianism has flourished or has been pushed to the agenda. First, after the Islamic Revolution in Iran, because the Saudis and the people in the Gulf realized that the winds of change are, were about to blow on them. So by creating sectarianism by saying Iran is a Shia, they are Persians, they played the two tones of sectarianism and ethnicity and, uh, and uh, racism to stop the ones of change, that they are different people, we have nothing to do with them. So they made the people busy with sectarianism uh, rather than being busy with the attempts to change. And the second time it came 
after Iraq change. And uh, I believe that even in Iraq, even if the prime minister today uh, is Sunni elected, as long as he is elected, those people in the uh, oil rich countries do not want that. They do not want to see the people playing the role of changing their own regimes. And, then, and just to make this clear to you, uh, Muslim brotherhood are not Shia, but they brought them down, regardless of whether their policies are good or bad, but, but because they were elected, they had to be brought down, and the whole regime has to, ha, has to collapse. The Mubarak has to come back, it has to be uh, acquitted by the, by, by, by the court a few months ago. His sons ha, ha, uh, have to be also acquitted by the court. Uh, his uh, last Prime Minister, Ahmed Shafiq, is now allowed to stand for elections. So the whole regime is brought back. Uh, so the Saudis and the, and the GCC countries would not like to see people being able to change themselves. And then lastly, they, uh, the, this uh, trend of sectarianism where was imposed again after the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring made it very clear that look, the winds of change are already blowing. You have it in uh, uh, in Syria, you have it in Yemen, you have it in Bahrain, all surrounding uh, the Arabian Peninsula, and then of course you have it in the bigger area, which is uh, Egypt. This had to stop. Sectarianism is a tool to repress the majority Sunnis, to keep them. Uh, in way, or under, I don't know, to keep them under control, to keep them busy with silly things rather than uh, really governing themselves. Uh, and I do not believe that those who are urging and promoting and financing extremism or sectarianism themselves really uh, are in the process of following Abu Bakr or Omar or Ali or any of these. They do not want to follow any of their predecessors of the good people uh, in history. They want to be to remain as dictators and as monarchs as they are, and the only way is to create this um, uh, this myth uh, of uh, sectarian. Because in every country, when you talk to a Shia from Bahrain or a Shia or a Sunni from Iraq or from anywhere, they will always tell you that we live together happily. We have lived for centuries. We never had problems. Why is it now that suddenly it appears that Shias against it? There's no inherent reason to have such a sharp increase in the sectarianism. And I agree with the brother of Quran that, uh, that the change this time and the defeat of this trend will come and should come from the Sunni world because it is them who are at loss. Because well, look at what's happened, even in Syria, they brought all the people. You see, and I, again, again, I agree with him that after uh, Afghanistan, they were uh, overwhelmed by the number of those people who were battle-hardened and who could come back to those countries and start to do uh, mayhem there. So they took them to to, to, Pakistan, to, to Iraq, and Iraq <coughs> is a play, uh, is uh, is is a burning, is a furnace, burning furnace for them. And then when Iraq was about to finish, they started the Syrian crisis. And of course, there was a revolution in Syria. Anyone who wants to deny that there was a revolution at the beginning is uh, denying the fact. There were people with genuine demands, but suddenly <coughs> that would not have been supported. A genuine change of regime uh, by the people in Syria would not have been supported by those monarchies. But this is why we saw now Syria has become another graveyard for our youth. I mean, those people who are being killed every day from whatever said. These are our people, they are humans. But who? But how could they be allowed to die in their hundreds, in their thousands, every day to die themselves and to kill the others? I think this is the biggest treachery of our rulers in modern history. And unless uh, this awareness is spread among the people, among the masses, so that they stand up against it and ensure that it fails, I think we will not be doing service to our own selves or to our own humanity. Thank you very much.
you very much. <coughs> Brother Saeed, normally I know you um, can speak for an hour very easily. It must have been difficult for you to restrain yourself for such a short time. <laughs> Thank you. Only 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I do want to open the floor uh, for questions, but I think two points um, that I think are very, very important in the discussions and the presentations that we've had is that dictators are neither Shia or Sunni. Similarly, terrorists are not Shias or Sunnis. Terrorists are simply criminals who need to be identified and clearly, um, uh, you know, as often and as regularly pointed out that terrorists are simple criminals and therefore uh, they do not really belong to any particular um, <coughs> religious thinking. With that comment, um, I would like to open the floor, if I may, and uh, we, I'm sure there's sort of keenness. I'll take one question here first, and I'll come to you in a minute. Uh, yes, uh, could we have a mic uh, for the brother, please? I think by talking about sectarianism, we are promoting sectarianism. The less we talk about it, the better. I'll ask the panels if there is any time, can we foresee a time when the Shia and Sunni can get together, sit, sit and reach a rapprochement? And in that doing, I think the Sunni have to give something and the Shia have to give something to reach an agreement. Can you foresee, no, Shabir, can you foresee a time when it can be possible? And uh, who creates uh, sectarianism? It's not the people actually, I mean, people love each other. I mean, I've been to around in Middle East, uh, Pakistan and all other countries, Muslim countries. They're, they're very amicable, friendly, you know, each other. So who creates sectarianism? Thank you. I'll take your question again. Uh, thank you, brothers. Uh, of course, uh, historically, uh, really, uh, the, the, we, we all lived uh, in, in this, in the, I mean, most of us probably, my age and <laughs> older, uh, in the 60s, for example, in the 70s, we never heard anything called sectarianism uh, between Shias or Sunnis. And even neither we had here even hatred between between Muslims and Christians or whatever. Uh, even even after Iranian Revolution, I, I might a little bit uh, distinguish between exactly after the, the Iranian Revolution and and, af, and 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 later on. Actually, in February 1979, February 1980, there was no sectarianism. Really, it was no. There was no sectarianism. It began really in, in probably the mid the mid eighty and 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 afterward because because of, of two main main things. First of all, the, the Saudis have seen how the the revolutionary mind has spread all over the Arab uh, and Islamic countries. Really, they have seen that this revolutionary will come to their 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 entities as well. This is one, and the, the other one, what, what Henry Kissinger is, in his book says, that after the hostages in, in, in Tehran, uh, and, and uh, they, have, they have taken steps to, to try and encounter the Iranian revolution by having allies with Saddam, who was, who was, who was a socialist, and he was, he was closer to, to Russians, and uh, and, 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 and giving some some uh, matters to the to the uh, to the Saudis to attack uh, Iran and, and of course through 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 Saddam in in the 80 in the 1979 and before you see uh, the mid 80s you could see one of the head of the of the Salafis in in, in uh, India and Pakistan uh, uh, Abu Ala Modudi uh, he was he was pro Iranian. He was, he was defending the Iranian revolution. He was not against the Iranian revolution. And Azhar was not against the Iranian revolution. It was not only, only after, after the, the Iran-Iraq war, and, and then, then in the 82, when, when there was a problem with, between 
the initial Hezbollah and the, the Americans, then it ex exodus. Just just to go for it. It is it is really it it was the time when, when the, the petrol uh, prices went, went very much up and there were lots of surpluses really and, and we've seen how much uh, the Saudi uh, the budget there was surplus surplus in, in the budget and they could open thousands and thousands of, of mosques in Europe in, in Africa mainly <coughs> promoting the, the extremist uh, Wahhabis also in Egypt they created Takfir al Hijra and then and then and then before that we didn't have you see, in, in the, in the, uh, until, until the, uh, for example, 1985, we, we didn't see even the Afghans mujahideen against Iran or against Shiism. Actually, they were supported by Iran also. The mujahideen also were supported. They were, they were having some haven in Iran also. But when the Taliban, what, what was the Taliban? The Taliban was uh, the, 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 the Minister of Interior of Pakistan was developing that and they, uh, they, they also went, of course, it was the American Saudi uh, faction which, which would develop that. In, in, in Egypt, they developed Hezb al Nur, uh, which uh, had around 25% of the votes. And, and before, like 15 years ago, you wouldn't see this, the, this Wahhabis in, in Egypt. Now they are, they are there for, for good. In, in, in Syria, it, it is the other way around. That's the, the last thing I want to, to mention. You see, the Syrians have been very close allies with the Saudis and the, and the, the Gulf states. They were actually, uh, they were in the, in the uh, liberation of Kuwait, the only Arab country which helped the, the Arab states in the Gulf to liberate Kuwait was Syria, to remember that. And also, they were, they were uh, the, 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 the guards which, which protected and went into Lebanon to put, put, to put some, some peace uh, after uh, 1982. But of course, later on, when they had clashes with the Saudis, after, uh, after 1992 and 1993, then, then the Saudis said, oh, we want the Saudi Syrians uh, to get out. Before that, there was nothing called the Nusairis or the Alawis in Syria. But after that, there was. So, so, so the, the last thing is that, you see, it's not actually the religion, sectarianism. It is the politics, sectarianism, really. It, whenever you find this politics, mainly because of, of, of some of the superpowers with some of the regional powers, don't want to, to lose their grounds, the strong grounds, then they, they will create this sectarianism against against Shias, against the, the, the Christians in Egypt and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. So <coughs> the problem there, he was very patient. I'll take a third question and then we, I'll, I'll come to you, Reverend, if I may. Yeah, the problem with the glasses near the window. Just elaborate more on why do you think the, the head of MI6 come to Americans and advise them not to establish democracy? Because it is very obvious today 
they're not supporting democracy in Bahrain. They were not supporting democracy in Syria, but they just want to get rid of the <coughs> Al-Assad regime, whether we like it or not. And they did not for sure want a democracy in Tunisia or Egypt. It's just they want the new Middle East as their plan. So if you can just elaborate more on that, we will be able to have more information and you know, understand the background more. Okay, thank you, Ron. I'll take the next set of questions after the speakers have addressed at the points raised. The first question was uh, really talking about sectarianism. Does that not feel sectarianism itself? Um, I think uh, my view on that is that what we have said, and I think uh, a number of people have agreed, that the sectarianism we are looking at today is not primarily doctrinal. It is not driven by the differences between the different sects which have been there. Everybody understands them and we know that with those differences we can live together. And have lived together. And have lived together. So why not now? So we are trying to say what new has come to make this coexistence impossible. Now it's not only Shi'is and Sunnis. You can see that apart from Iran, every other Muslim country has turned against the Christians. And why not Iran? So again, you try to understand why an Armenian Christian community is living as an integral part of Iran. Whereas it's been hounded out in Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, in Pakistan. So it's a mindset. Uh, we're not looking, so it's not doctrinal in the sense, because a long time ago, and since the inception of Islam, the uh, people of the book have been accommodated. There has not been any, inc any incitement to fight them or do anything. So they are people of the book, fine. You can do all kinds of social interactions with them. So there hasn't been a problem. So this just shows you that it's it's a not doctrinal issue. It's not doctrinal. I, so I think when we are talking about sectarianism, the brother may be right. We are he understands we are talking about doctrinal differences. We are not at the moment looking at doctrinal differences. We are looking at forces which want to use these differences to make it true as much as possible. Okay. Did you want to address? Um, I agree with Akbar again that uh, it is not doctrinal in the sense that we are not discussing uh, differences in re religion, religious differences. We are not discussing why the Shias, for example, do not put their hands like this when they pray. This is not the issue and it's not being uh, on the discussion table. We are discussing a crisis that, has that is gra gradually becoming out of control. Let me give you examples. When you see the uh, ancient mosques in Mali being systematically demolished, and the mosques in Libya also getting the same fate, being uh, destroyed. Mosques in Tunisia, in Egypt, in, in Bahrain. The first thing that happened after the Saudi invasion of Bahrain in 2011 was the destruction of 40 mosques. When you see mosques, not only of the Shias, okay, you may say that in Bahrain they destroyed 40 uh, mosques of the Shia, but what about Egypt, what about Mali, what about Libya, what about Tunisia? 500, 600 years old mosques, these are, this is heritage of Muslims. Why do you go and attack them and destroy them? And then, why do you go to Mecca itself and build the largest tower in the world, or the largest, the biggest clock in the world, to dwarf the Kaaba. How nice it is to have something old. Because they're too old to keep time. Okay. So, <laughs> why do you have to have a clock that can be seen from 10 or 15 kilometers away? What is good about it? What is progressive about it? So, when you target, when 90 percent of the Islamic heritage in Hijaz, in Mecca and Medina, have already been demolished. 
when the people of Hijaz themselves, and if anybody of you wants to read that, he should just go and Google what Sami Ankawi is from Hijaz, from Mecca, uh, is talking about, crying, because they see that their own heritage is being systematically demolished. He is crying for her because he said, why do we have, why does our heritage has to be have to be destroyed in this way? Why, for example, the stick of King Abdul Aziz, his stick, his open stick, is, is contained in a, kept in a museum, his Cadillac, his big uh, car, his uh, rosary tasbih, uh, was, uh, they are all kept in nice uh, tidy place. Why? The heritage, the seven mosques of the Sahaba, they are called seven mosques in, uh, um, in Mecca, or is it in Medina? In Medina, have been completely demolished. Seven mosques, which, which goes back to Salman Farisi, Umar ibn Khattab, all of them have been demolished. None of them remains. About, in, sorry, there's a story I want to tell you about. Uh, maybe I, some of you heard it from me. But in 2001, 2000, 2000 I think, uh, Ahmed Zaki Yamani, uh, the former uh, Minister of Oil of Saudi Arabia, delivered a lecture at Sawas here, and I was there. And he, the whole lecture was about he uh, himself bringing a team of 300 um, engineers, builders, working over 24-hour period in uh, Mecca, opening up the Prophet's house, I, I think in Medina, in Medina. The Prophet's house is in Medina. Medina. Or, or digging up the, the Prophet's house, which was about a meter high, uh, taking pic images, pictures of it, a complete set of pictures and videos, and then putting sand again, covering it. Um, and he was asked, why do you do that? Spend like, millions in order to bring, and uh, it is very sophisticated work. He said, of course, we have in Saudi Arabia some people who think that uh, by bringing up the house of the of the prophet. This is shit. This is apostasy. Uh, so we had to cover it by sand in case that he said in case the situation in Saudi Arabia changes and some people in the future want to dig it up again. It is made easier for them. So this is the, this is what we see today. And I with uh, with regards to our friend, uh, she has so is always lived together. You, I have known you for many years. Have we ever had any difference of any kind? Why, why, why should we have differences? We have always prayed together. We have always lived together and tolerated, not only not tolerated or accepted, but loved each other. So it is only the outside influence that is trying to show that we are uh, at odds and enemies, and we should, each one of us should be uh, cut the, the neck of the other. But, uh, 99% of the Muslims are not like that. Um, the other interesting question that was raised was this, um, um, you know, the MI6 uh, issue, whether really, in reality, um, is democracy something that the Americans and the British or the Washington consensus really desires? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't think, uh, as our uh, brother pointed out, I don't think the Americans were any more desirous of having democracy in Iraq than the British were. Right? Uh, I think they thought, and they still think, that a minority Sunni dictatorship will not be stable in Iraq. They wanted a Shi dictator, um, which by fits and starts they have not been able to deliver. They wanted uh, fixed military bases, etc., etc. But I think their plans have not gone according to what. I don't think they wanted democracy. But they disagreed. They told the British that the time when you can impose or you can bring a face of Jordan and put him as king of Iraq, this is gone. You have to now find new ways to control this. 
And so my take is not on that they wanted democracy. I think if they wanted democracy, they couldn't. Win. However, there are a couple of things which are happening which may change this whole narrative. I forgot to mention towards my end. Last 30, 40 years, most of American policy in the Middle East has been dictated by the American need for oil. So their bargain with the Saudis is that you keep the oil flowing and we turn away from your force, whatever, including, can you imagine if 70% of the alleged perpetrators of 9-11 were Saudis, 